Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar, An Introduction to Becoming Your Own Banker. I'm Jason Lowe, Ascendant Financials uh, CEO. It's a real pleasure to have you here with us this evening. Uh, thank you all for arriving early, uh, respecting the use of your time. We're going to get underway. So before I dive into the webinar this evening, I just want to do a quick audio check. Uh, please go ahead, type into the chat window that uh, you're hearing my audio crystal clear and that my video is coming through as well. All right, good. Ready to go, 63, okay. Let me just share my screen here so we can get things, get things underway. All right, so welcome again, everybody. Glad to have you here. What a peaceful, stress-free way of life it is when you get the banks out of your life. This is something that Nelson Nash, the developer, the pioneer, the founder of the process of becoming your own banker used to say so often. What a powerful, powerful quote, and it is so true. You've been told by others to put your money away into things like retirement accounts, mutual funds, stocks, gold, silver, uh, you put your own money in prison and then go to someone else's bank when you need access to more money. It's absurd. And I'm telling you that if you've been handing control of your money over to someone else who thinks they can do better with it than you can, you may not be in the best situation right now. But I'm here to tell you that it's not your fault. We've all been conditioned as it relates to money, as it relates to banks, as it relates to life insurance companies. We've been influenced by people in our lives whether it was a colleague or our parents, our grandparents, our next door neighbor, someone in our life who has had some influence as it relates to what we should be doing with our money, how we should be conducting our financial affairs throughout the course of our lifetime. You're going to discover a different way this evening. Now, the first thing I wanna do is sincerely applaud all of you for being here. You could have been doing something else with your time and you chose to spend it with us. Thank you. You're so committed to discovering the process of becoming your own banker. You're so committed to radically improving anything that you're already doing financially that you're giving up other things to be here with us. And I want to applaud you for that commitment. Thank you. I always like to start off, you know, uh, each one of our webinars by sharing with you that I personally discovered the path to a peaceful, stress-free financial life the hard way. And I want to share with you a little bit more about that. I'll never forget this. I was standing in an empty, dark living room, and I was staring out at a sold sign on the front lawn. This was in uh, Westboro in Sherwood Park, Alberta. And I was feeling like a failure, uh, very stressed and defeated. And I never would have expected to be here after doing all the things right financially. How was it possible that doing everything right got me here? A few years before that, I was 30 years young. I was married, had a mortgage, very ambitious about my future. And up to that point in my life, I was doing all the right things according to mainstream financial advice. Over the course of the next few years, life decided to hand me several big challenges all at once. My first marriage was over. I was deeply in debt, was on the brink of financial ruin, and I endured the unexpected passing of my mom and dad. Some of the most stressful events you can experience over a lifetime happened to me in just a few short years. And standing all alone in that empty, dark living room, I didn't know who to turn to for help. And just when I felt like I hit rock bottom, I remembered something that my late father used to say, son, don't ever be found guilty of giving up on yourself. And I made the decision in that moment to take control of my life. And in 2008, I was contacted by a friend. Matt was a very successful and established business owner. And he invited me to attend an event. And the topic was what I later learned to be the process of becoming your own banker, the infinite banking concept. I didn't have the money to go. Uh, but being determined to find answers, I decided to do whatever it took to get there. So I took action. I left that conference 
believing that everyone should hear this process. I began to implement this process in my life and everything changed for the better. Today, I'm remarried to my beautiful wife, Rebecca. We have four young children. I no longer feel stressed financially. My family and I are in total control of our money and we're no longer worried about the ups and downs of markets. And because of this process, my family and I will never have another bad financial day in our lives while I'm here and long after I'm gone. I believe that financial power and control should be in your hands, not the banks, not a loan officer, not the government, and not some temperamental stock market. Over the next couple hours, I'm going to take the past 12 years of time and energy that I spent in becoming an expert at this process to show you exactly how I've helped thousands of people just like you to build your peaceful, stress-free financial way of life. Does that sound good? Give me a heck yeah. Type that into the chat window. Everybody can see what you're typing. All right, let's get back at it. Now, most people believe that they need someone else to take care of their money. That's been our experience. And most people believe that it's necessary to risk their money in order to grow it. Most people know next to nothing about the process of banking and its importance to their lives and to their well-being. Here's the truth. The difference between you getting stressed or staying relaxed financially is who controls the banking function in your life and someone must perform that function. You don't have to put your money in prison for decades and rely on someone else to achieve the financial abundance you deserve today. And thirdly, you don't have to be rich to become your own banker. Now, who is this process for? Whether you're an entrepreneur, an established business owner, uh, an investor, whether you invest in real estate, stocks, bonds, options, etc., you're a high income earner, you're inexperienced, just getting started, you're experienced, you're in retirement, nearing retirement, you are a family, you're in debt, maybe looking for ways to recapture the interest that you're presently paying to banks, to credit card companies, to finance companies. I'm here to tell you that anything that you're already doing financially is radically improved when you introduce the process of becoming your own banker. The way that this process began back in the early 1980s, R. Nelson Nash found himself in a very tough financial situation. Now, for those of you on the webinar, you may be aware that in the early 1980s, inflation skyrocketed. Interest rates peaked at 21.5%. So many people had to walk away from their homes, their property, their vehicles, anything that they had financed where the payments jumped dramatically almost overnight. Now, Nelson found himself in a situation where he owed $500,000 in mortgage debt because he was heavily invested in real estate. Now, what he shared with us was that during that period of time, all the financial entertainers were saying, use someone else's money, OPM, and go and purchase a bunch of real estate because after all, real estate can never go down, right? Wrong. And you can use other people's money to invest in that asset and it's only gonna go up. But nobody sat down and talked to Nelson about what would happen if the interest rate lever went the other way. So he was able to access the money at a very low rate of interest. And then when interest rates peaked at 21.5%, he found himself owing more than $100,000 a year to the banks just in interest. Now, naturally, he thought, you know what? If I talk to anybody about this, they're just gonna say, Nelson, why don't you just sell the real estate? And he thought to himself, what fool is going to purchase that real estate from me when they're borrowing money from the commercial banks at a minimum of 21.5%? What he didn't realize in that moment was that the solution to the problem was right in front of him. He had been accumulating cash value inside of multiple participating dividend paying whole life insurance policies. He didn't realize that the solution to the problem was for him to access policy loans from the insurance company at 8% and pay off the snakes and dragons at 21 and 
once he came to that realization, it took him 13 years to get rid of those snakes and dragons. And since that time, him and his wife, Mary, did not see a commercial bank for anything other than the convenience of debit for the rest of their lifetime. Nelson said, it is such a peaceful, stress-free financial life when you get the banks out of your life. That's what he meant. He didn't have to rely on commercial banks for anything other than the convenience of debit. Everyone needs a heart. Would you agree? Now, I want you to think about this analogy that I'm about to share with you. Many years ago, Nelson had to have his heart replumbed in four different places. To get that surgery completed, he had to be put under and he had to be connected to a heart and lung machine because his heart was physically out of his chest for a few hours being replumbed. Now he said, obviously, I don't recall the experience because I was put under, but what he came to realize is that during that time when he was connected to the heart and lung machine, he wasn't living. He was only merely existing. And so what he would share with folks when he was presenting this process is he would say, listen, I want you to understand that banking is the most important business in the world. It pumps money to where it's needed the most. And at some point it flows through your hands and mine, right? Where does it all end up? It ends up right back in the banking system. The issue here is how much of the banking function do you control as it relates to your needs? I want you to understand that there's only one pool of money in the world. Money flows from that pool through our hands to meet our needs, but somewhere in the process, it all ends up right back in the banking system. It's inconsequential that there are many different banking institutions that are managing this pool of money. It's inconsequential that there are many different currencies. There's only one pool of money in the world. Now, what Nelson saw is that he was pumping money into the pool the wrong way. He had to go through the bankers, the toll takers, the gatekeepers, who were all making money off of him and abusing him. Has that ever happened to you? He realized that what he needed to do was he needed to crank up large life insurance premiums inside of dividend paying, participating whole life policies so that he could create a pool of financial value that only goes up in value every day, cannot go down, so that he not only had money available for things that he would have otherwise financed elsewhere in his lifetime, but so that he could also take advantage of opportunity that tracked him down. And when you have a ready access pool of capital, opportunity will track you down. You can't do this overnight. Everyone thought that Nelson was crazy including his wife, Mary. You have to get it done incrementally over a period of time. Now, what's very important to understand are the four characters in the financial play. The first character is the depositor. The second character is the borrower. The third is the banker. And the fourth is the bank owner. Now, for the majority of people that we meet with, the overwhelming majority, you're only two characters in the financial play. You're the depositor. So you're depositing money on the books of someone else's bank. I'll say that again, someone else's bank. You're the borrower, even when you pay cash for things. We meet with people all the time who say, I have no debt. When I wanna buy something, I save up money, I withdraw it, I pay for what I wanted to purchase, I have no debt. But you're always working with borrowed money. I'll expand on that here momentarily. When you become all four characters in the financial play, you not only accumulate the wealth, but you truly have become your own banker. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you here. What's important to recognize before that is the golden rule. You may have heard of this rule before. Those who have the gold make the rules. Well, Nelson shared that people have abdicated their opportunity and more importantly, their responsibility as it pertains to the banking function in the economy. They're depending on someone else to perform that job. And that character in the play is the one who's making most of the money. And rightly so, because of the golden rule. Those who have the gold make the rules. So ask yourself this question. Would you rather only continue to be two of the four characters in the financial play? Or do you want to 
me to describe how to become all four. Go ahead and type in the chat window. Let me know what you'd like to see happen. Do you want to remain only two of the four characters in the financial play or do you want me to describe how to become all four? All right, good. We're going to encourage a lot of engagement in tonight's talk. The person on the street in Canada today truly understands the process of banking this subject so poorly that he's doing the equivalent of living off of a heart and lung machine. It's absurd. And I want you to truly take a moment to think about that. In your financial life, you're doing the equivalent of living off of a heart and lung machine. Someone else and some other organization is keeping you alive financially. It doesn't have to be that way. You can and you should change it. What I want to talk to you about is how to create a system in which you can control everything about the banking equation as it relates to your needs. Now, this book titled Becoming Your Own Banker, if at any point during the webinar you find yourself thinking, okay, this is really resonating with me. I want to understand more about this process. I want to read the book that was authored by the developer, the pioneer, the founder of this concept. You're going to receive a link. It's going to be emailed to you, text messaged to you to purchase your copy of Becoming Your Own Banker. So if you find yourself thinking, hey, this is a great process. I'd like to add this book to my library. Just go ahead and click through the link. We sell it for less. We ship it anywhere in Canada. And once you receive the book, one reading of it just won't do the job. I read this book and every single time I read it, I see something that I didn't see the previous time that I've read it. Nelson used to say all the time, the more you see this process, the more you'll see you didn't see. So when you get that link, go ahead, click through it, purchase your copy. But if you don't, as long as you're happy, that's okay too. We're gonna to have some fun on tonight's webinar. So here's the very first principle that must be understood. You finance everything that you buy. You either pay interest to someone else or you give up the interest that you could have earned otherwise. The whole idea, the whole essence of the process of becoming your own banker is to recapture the interest that you're presently paying to banks, to finance companies, for all the major items that you need during your lifetime, whether that's vehicles, property, uh, businesses, investment, real estate, um, whatever your financial objective is. The whole objective here is to have that money flowing back to your household or your business versus flowing away. If you're a business owner, type into the chat window, yes. The whole objective is to keep that money flowing back to your business, flowing back to your family, not flowing away from it. Now, throughout tonight's webinar, there will likely be some questions that come up for you. There's a Q&A window. I want you to type your questions into the Q&A window. One of my teammates, Sarblo Gill, is moderating tonight's uh, Q&A window. So go ahead and make sure you type your questions in there. Questions are good for the benefit of everyone who's in attendance. So we're going to have a Q&A period at the end of the webinar that you don't want to miss. That's one of the most valuable parts of the webinar because the questions benefit everyone who's there. So stick around. You'll be glad you did. Here's something that is so fundamentally true. Your money must reside somewhere. So regardless of what your financial objectives are, your capital has to reside somewhere. What better place to have it reside than here? The question is, how much of the banking function do you control as it relates to your needs? Someone must perform this function of banking in your life and it should be you. Now, I wanna emphasize this process is not an either or. So this is not a consideration of I should become my own banker or I should put my money into real estate. I should become my own banker or I should buy stocks, bonds, or mutual funds. I should become my own banker or I should purchase that business. This is all about as well as. Becoming your own banker has absolutely nothing to do with addressing the yield of an investment. It's a process. It's all about how you go about financing the things in your life, which can certainly include investments. The process is not an investment. It is a function of how you go about financing the things in your life. Now, I want to talk about getting into the grocery store business. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, what on earth is Jason doing talking about a grocery store? I thought I was here to learn about how to become my own banker. Nelson would say, that if you understand the grocery store example, the rest of the process is ridiculously simple. 
If you don't understand the grocery store example, the rest of the process is going to feel complicated for you. So bear with me as I get through this. I'd love your input. Any questions that come up for you, type them into the Q&A window. Now let's imagine for a second that we're all going to get into the grocery store business. The first thing we need to do is we have to consider that this is a business in which we are both a consumer as well as a seller of a product. Every human being needs to eat. You have to get your food from somewhere. Now think about this as it relates to the banking business. We all need the use of money and we have to get the capital from somewhere. Now, your market's unlimited, right? Everyone uses groceries, everyone needs money. Someone has to perform the function of distribution, no different than banking. Someone has to perform that function as it relates to your needs. You have to study the business for two years. It's not gonna take you two years to discover how to become your own banker, I promise you. You have to purchase a superior location. You have to build an attractive building. You have to stock it with high quality merchandise. Now up to this point in the process, how much money have we made in our grocery store business? Go ahead and type that into the chat window. How much money have we made up to this point? You got it, Maladin, none, Sid, none, Doug, none. All right, it just keeps pouring in, none, you got it. So we're going through a capitalization phase, but once we open those doors and we're ready to start serving customers, we must turn the inventory at least 15 times just to break even. Think about what happens when money sits stagnant in the financial system. What happens to the banking business if money sits still? The banking business collapses. What happens to groceries if the inventory doesn't turn over? It wouldn't take long for the bread to go bad, for the milk to go bad. We're talking about keeping the products in constant motion, no different than the banking business. The banks must keep money in constant motion, otherwise it's not worth anything. You turn the inventory 17 times, you'll be profitable. If you can turn it 20 times, you can retire early. So what's the, what is the key teaching moment here? We're talking about velocity and we're talking about volume. It has nothing to do with the rate. It has everything to do with the volume. So the more we turn the inventory over, the more profitable our business becomes. Now I want you to envision this for a moment. Most people have little to no idea just how slim the margins are in the grocery business. So if we were to utilize a can of peas as an example, and we said, look, we're going to retail the can of peas out the front door of our grocery store for 60 cents. We're gonna purchase the can of peas at wholesale for 57 cents. So we're making three pennies for every can of peas that we sell. Now, because you're the owner of the business, I'm going to put control in your hands. So I wanna ask you this question. You're the owner, you decide. I wanna know that as the owner, would you take your groceries out the back door or would you go through the front door and pay retail? Go ahead and type that into the chat window. Okay, Doug, front door, Meg, pardon me, Maladin, uh, Meg, front door, Robert, You'd pay retail, you go out the front door. Nephi, front door. Okay, so Leticia, you said you don't understand the question. So we all need food. So if you're the owner of the grocery store, you're in your own store now and you need a can of peas. Would you walk out the back door with the can of peas? Because you can, because you're the owner. Or would you go to the cash register and pay retail and walk out the front door? Now, most people say, front door but we do have some folks who say i'd go out the back door well let's see what would happen if we did that if we went out the back door how many cans of peas would we have to sell just to make up for the 57 cents that we lost and the three pennies that we could have otherwise earned we would have to sell 20 cans of peas just to make up for the one can that walked out the back door and if your employees see you doing that what are your employees going to do they're going to walk out the back door with inventory as well. It shouldn't surprise you that the greatest percentage of theft that occurs in retail is internal from the owners and the employees. And so Nelson would always say, don't steal the peas. This is what he means. When you access policy loans from the insurance company, if you borrow the capital and you go out the back door and you have no intention of repaying your policy loans, 
That's a polite description of theft from your own business. Here's what I want you to remember in this example. As the owner of the grocery store, I don't want you to consider paying 60 cents for the canopies. I want you to consider paying 62 because the extra pennies that you put into the cash register, you can go out and purchase more inventory to sell to more captive customers. So if you think about this from the perspective of becoming your own banker, when you become a part owner of the insurance company and you know that your money must reside somewhere, don't just put back in the amount that the insurance company calls for in the way of simple interest on a policy loan. You should put more money back in. That enables the insurance company to uh, multiply more capital, to have more money available to more captive customers. What does that do to our business? So if we have more money available to buy more cans of peas and we can sell more cans of peas to more captive customers, what does that do to our inventory turnover? It increases it. We get to turn it over more and more. The more we do it, the more profitable we are. The process of becoming your own banker is ridiculously simple. It doesn't need to be sensationalized. I get it. Don't steal the peas. Remember that. That's one of Nelson Nash's five golden rules. Don't steal the peas. I've been talking all day, so you'll have to forgive me. All right, here's the problem. Who's the banker in your life today? I want you to ask yourself that question. If it isn't you, it can and it should be. Here's what happens. Whenever a transaction takes place, so money has to flow, right, from one party to another in a relatively short time frame. otherwise nothing happens. So you've got the banking system, there's you, the buyer, and you need to exchange money, transfer that to the seller so that you can purchase whatever it is that you need. Doesn't matter what it is. Where does the seller put that money? Right back into the banking system. So the essence of what the banking business is all about is that someone or some organization has control over a pool of financial value that can and must flow at a cost to meet some need. That money comes out of and ends up right back in someone else's bank. It's so important for me to frame up the problem with you because if you don't understand the problem, the solution just won't matter to you anyway. So I say this again, your money that you're handling right now is flowing through the books of someone else's bank. You earn an income, doesn't matter what the source of the income is. T4, dividend income, rental income, interest income, all the above. You earn it, the bank sees it first. For all of you on the webinar who earn a T4 income, where does your employer deposit your money, your wages? Into someone else's bank. Someone else's bank sees the money before you do. The money sits there waiting for you to pay your bills. Now, we all know that the banks cannot let money sit still. Any deposit into the bank is a liability to the bank. It's not an asset. They have to get money moving. Think of the grocery store. We have to turn the inventory over. So the bank must keep that money in constant motion. You pay your bills. You purchase goods and services. Your money ends up right back in someone else's bank. This all results, this phenomenon results in a permanent and transfer, uh, constant transfer of money away from you your family and your business. In other words, you're doing all the work and everyone else is getting all your money. How does that make you feel? Type into the chat window and tell me, how does that make you feel? Thank you, Nephi. Yes, interesting, there has to be flow. Money that isn't in motion isn't in worth anything. Okay, people saying they feel cheated, taken advantage of, not happy, hustled, uh, boo, <laughs> Julius, like a sucker. <laughs> Well, look, it's not your fault. Mad as hell, frustrated. Yeah, those are the most common responses. Now I want you to think about this. The person on top here in the red is the debtor. Now this person sees the interest because it's part of their payment. So imagine this, you go to the bank and you decide that you need to borrow money to purchase a car. You get approved for the loan after you go through the gatekeeper, the toll taker, you fill out a lengthy nosy credit application. You have to qualify to access someone else's pile of money. Think about that for a moment. The moment that you are in debt, you start at a negative balance. So you start down here. I'm pointing there with my mouse. 
and let me see if I can just annotate this. Let's have a little fun. Let's see if I can draw. There we go. So you're starting right here. Now you don't own anything until you make the final payment. So you're making payments, which is a deposit into someone else's bank, and you don't own anything until you make the final payment. And once you've made that final payment, you're right back at zero. So you achieved your objective of purchasing the car, but you transferred all your money away from you. And you see the interest component because it's baked into your payment. Now, in contrast, the saver, this is someone who says, listen, I don't go into debt. I save up my money and then I withdraw it and I go and purchase the car. Well, let's see if they came out any farther ahead than or behind than the debtor. The saver is stacking up money in someone else's bank. Every payment, everything that you're depositing is a, is a deposit into someone else's system. You accumulate the money you need to buy the car. You make a withdrawal. You're right back down to zero too. Now, the saver doesn't see the interest that they're giving up the opportunity to earn. Here's what happens in the consumer mindset all the time. The focus, which is what the banks want you to be focused on, is how much interest am I going to pay? When's the last time you sat down and asked yourself, how much interest am I giving up the opportunity to earn? You have to rethink your thinking. The saver didn't come out any further ahead than the debtor. Think about that for a moment. Both methods involved a permanent transfer of money away from you. We've got to change that. We've just got to change that. So let's do this. Let's go back to the mouse here. There we go. Now, the solution is to become your own banker. We know that your money must reside somewhere. Let's go through a thought experiment that's a lot of fun because we have uh, experienced in our lives, or maybe some of you on the webinar are currently experiencing this, which is an investor's mindset. Not a bad mindset to have. I want you to think about this. Let's go through this fun thought experiment. If you could invent a type of asset from scratch, okay, so you've got a clean slate. You can invent this asset from scratch. It had no drawbacks whatsoever. What attributes would it have? Now, I'd love for you to type in the chat window. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kickstart it. One of the attributes might be a high rate of return. Let's carry on the discussion. Let's see, what attributes would you want it to have? Okay, Dan says liquidity. What other attributes would your perfect investment have? No taxes due, thank you, Sandy. Uh, Leticia, it's putting money into my pocket. Robert says compounding. Uh, Julius says be accessible in good times and bad. That's very, very interesting. Thank you, Julius. Uh, Barb says monthly income. Um, Aaron says not influenced by market sentiment. Alan says high interest. Nephi says flow of money in and out. Okay, these are all great attributes. Thank you. Let's see how they stack up to the most frequently communicated attributes in all of the presentations that we've done. Tell me if any of these look familiar. High rate of return, consistent rate of return, conservative, in other words, it's safe. It's liquid, it's guaranteed. There's tax benefits or maybe even tax-free. There's no market volatility. It yields income besides capital gain. It's creditor protected. It's inflation protected. You have a position of total and absolute control. It's transferable. It's easy to manage. There's no hidden fees or penalties. It's reputable and private. I want you to take a moment and just think about your own various assets and simply identify which of the features from the list above that your assets do well on and which of the features they fail to satisfy. Just take a moment just to ruminate on this and think about that. Of all of your various assets, which of the features of the list do they do well on and which of the features do they fail to satisfy? I've got a surprise for you. The list of attributes most accurately describes a dividend paying whole life policy. Isn't that good? Let's expand on the tool because participating dividend paying whole life is not an investment. It never has been, it never will be. A dividend paying whole life policy is a unilateral contract. The insurance company itself assumes 100% of the risk and is legally bound to fulfill 
a number of contractual guarantees. Now I want to clarify the anatomy of this tool for you because it's just a tool. And I'd like to share with you that if we put the best tool for the job in the hands of someone who doesn't know how to use it, not only are they not going to turn out any good work with the tool, they're likely going to break the damn tool. And so understanding that becoming your own banker is a process, it's not a product, but we need this tool in order to create the platform for us to implement the process. Now here's it, the tool broken down. Participating means that you become a part, basically a part owner of the life insurance company and you participate in the divisible surplus generated. And if you're dealing with a mutual life company where there are no stockholders, you participate in the profit generated from every line of business that the insurance company operates in because the sole beneficiaries of the divisible profit are the owners of the company. And that can be you. You can be a part owner of a company that's never failed to produce profit. And we have a 173 year track record in Canada. Yes, you heard me right. That's a 173 year track record, long before Revenue Canada, long before mutual funds, long before RSPs, long before the stock markets, these companies have been producing profit. Now they've weathered the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, H1N1, SARS, the financial crisis of 0809, 30 recessions, and COVID-19. These life carriers are thriving during this crisis. They're not contracting. What does that tell you? Your money must reside somewhere. What better place to have it reside than here? Dividend paying means that each year the life insurance company declares a dividend, it's contractually guaranteed to be paid, and it can never be repossessed or lose value. Now, some of you may be thinking, or some of you may have heard, dividends are not guaranteed. I'm here to tell you that the only dividend that isn't guaranteed is the one that hasn't been declared yet. So important to understand. And the life carriers that we work with have never failed to declare dividends, ever. Isn't that good? And whole life means you are life insured for your whole life to age 100. The total cash value of the policy, the total cash value of the policy must equal the total death benefit by age 100. So that means that if you're the life insured, every single day that you're aging closer to 100, what's happening to your total cash value in the policy? It's rising. Now our clients during COVID they communicate to us regularly. We can literally reach through the computer and wrap you in a bear hug because we had ready access to capital. You can access policy loans from the insurance company without qualification. The insurance company will ask you two questions. Would you like us to electronically deposit the money in your checking account or can we mail you a check? Think about that. In one of the un most unprecedented times that we've experienced in our lives, a phone call, an email with a loan request, the money shows up in your account, you control the repayment schedule, nobody's asking you what you need the money for, how long you need the money for, what your intentions are to repay it. That creates a peaceful, stress-free financial existence. How many of you want a peaceful, stress-free financial existence? Give me a thumbs up. Give me something in the chat window. It says, yeah, if you don't want that, hop off the webinar. I'll give you the rest of your evening back. I want to hear from everybody. We got 76 people on the webinar. Type it in. This is all about commitment. Yes. Awesome. All right. Now, we don't have many financial guarantees in life anymore. We all know that. Pensions are going by the wayside. There's doubt about the future. Dividend paying life insurance can help create that peace of mind and unmatched financial security. Here's how. The cash values begin accumulating immediately. They're contractually guaranteed to grow daily. Cash values cannot go down. There's no stock market manipulation. There's no government intervention. There's no um, risk that you would otherwise incur if you had invested money. There's nothing that can take this capital away. Easy access and control over, to a, over a growing pool of financial value that you can use to take advantage of opportunity that will track you down. I'll say it again. 
when you have ready access capital, opportunity will track you down. You're not penalized for accessing it early, just like you are inside of an RSP or any other financial product. There's several tax advantages, both personally and corporately. If you're a business owner, you're going to love the corporate advantages that this tool presents to you. It provides a growing death benefit, which is paid to your named beneficiaries, income tax-free. Look, you are your greatest advantage. Be a wealth creator. Here's how this works. This green line is your cash value, which is rising daily. The red line is when you access a policy loan. So let's presume here at the first dot, we've got 10,000 of policy loan amount available. We can access it. So now we have a loan balance and we repay that policy loan on our schedule, not anyone else's. So you're in a position of total and absolute control. But what's happening to your total cash value every single day that you have a loan balance? Your cash value is rising. But remember, what was the, the golden rule in the grocery store example? Don't steal the what? Complete the sentence in the chat window. Don't steal the, the peas. You got it, Maladin. You got it, Dean. You got it, Barissa. You got it, Monty. James, yes. Don't steal the peas. So by you making policy loan repayments, you're not stealing the peas. Your cash value is rising every single day. And the more you turn over your inventory, the more profitable you become. And you need the use of money. And money must flow from one supply source to another in a relatively short time frame. Otherwise, nothing happens. Become your own banker. Become all four characters in the financial play. You're the depositor. You pay the premium. You're the borrower. You're accessing policy loans. You're the banker because you call the shots. You determine how and when you repay your policy loans. And you're the bank owner because when the insurance company declares dividends, who do they pay them to? The owners of the company. Become all four uh, characters in the financial play. Creating your own system. Let's talk about Nelson Nash's five golden rules. The first one is think long range. Now what Nelson meant by that is he meant to think three generations past your own. So think about, again, the grocery store example. If you are taking the money out the back door and your family sees you doing that, the only thinking that's happening that's long range is negative because the generation that comes after you is going to repeat the very same behavior. And the generation that comes after them is going to repeat the very same behavior. So don't steal the peas. Don't be afraid to capitalize your system. Your money must reside somewhere. So you should be storing capital inside your system. You should be ensuring everyone that you have a beneficial interest in and your system should expand to the degree where it can accommodate all of your income. It doesn't happen overnight. It took Nelson 13 years to get the snakes and dragons out of his life. It took my wife, Rebecca and I seven years. Don't steal the peas. Don't do business with banks. Every single time you borrow money from a commercial bank, you're contributing to inflation because the bank creates money where no money existed before. The insurance company cannot inflate the money supply. Commercial banks are inflating the money supply as you attend this webinar. It's happening right now. Insurance companies cannot inflate the money supply. Fifth is to rethink your thinking. We've all developed a way of thinking. We all look at the world with a bias. Whether you think you do or not, you do. You have to rethink your thinking in order to grasp this process. The simplest catalyst is the grocery store example. If you understand the grocery store example, the rest of this is ridiculously simple. I promise you. Now we live in a world, we all know this. If somebody text messaged you right now, when are they going to expect a reply? Tomorrow? No, they expect a response now. We live in a world of instant gratification, instant coffee, instant food. I text you, I want to reply now. I send you an email, I expect a reply now. There's a major problem with that. It doesn't leave you with time to think. So make sure that as you catch this, as you catch this process, that you take the time to rethink your thinking. Now, let's talk about individuals and families. I wanna start with Dave Klein. Dave Klein has been a client of mine for years. Now, he's someone who completed this class a few years ago, and we used to do these events live and in person, which I, I miss, I can't wait to get back on, on the stage and be in front of so many wonderful people. 
but Dave completed the class and he asked the question, can you take a look at my financial situation? Can you help me to implement becoming your own banker in, in my life? And of course the answer was yes, we can certainly do that. Now, one of the things that I always like to share in uh, our webinars is I like to talk about uh, these specific client examples because they're relevant. These are real people, real people who are practicing this process in their lives. And I wanna show you what David had to say. Now, David uh, went on to talk about how he's been uh, practicing this process for seven years and two years after opening their first policy, they took out a policy loan and paid off a bank loan on his wife's Subaru, redirecting the payments from the commercial bank back to our family bank. Three years later, year five, we took out another policy loan and skipped the bank entirely this time, using the money to buy me a brand new SUV outright. In year five, we also had another child, took out a policy on him, as well as a second policy on myself. With five policies now in force after seven years, our mortgage was coming up for renewal. Instead of renewing with our bank, we took out a policy loan from each of our five policies and paid off the mortgage. We now make the same payments as we did before, so he's an honest banker, and we will pay off the mortgage faster because of how the interest is calculated. Now, they get to reuse the money that would have otherwise permanently left their family. It's now flowing back to them. This is just one example. Now, David didn't say, hey, he didn't say anywhere in his testimony here that he had to work harder, that he had to take on any additional risk, that he uh, had to give up control of his money. To the contrary, he took on no risk. He didn't have to work any harder. He didn't change his cash flow. He was just changing the process of who's getting the money. Isn't that good? Let me, let, me, uh, let me read a heck yeah. Go ahead and type that in, if you believe it. There we go. Now, one of the most common questions that I get is, Jason, can you connect me with the right person on your team to take a look at my financial situation and show me how to become my own banker? The answer is yes. We have a Becoming Your Own Banker call designed just for that. Now, click the link that you've received. So you've either gotten a text or an email. You can click the link and schedule a Becoming Your Own Banker call. It's included with the webinar. So your experience isn't complete until you've had that, that call. So click the link to schedule um, and reserve a day and time that works best for you. Or you can use your phone and you can text the word schedule to 587-816-6399. That's 587-816-6399. And reserve a day and time that works best for you. Now, I know, and you should know deep down that you're capable of becoming your own banker. We're never going to give up on you. Here's the follow-up that you can expect from us. We're going to communicate with you via email. We're going to give you courtesy reminders to schedule your call. It's important for us because we care. That's why we're following up with you. That's why you're going to receive emails from us encouraging you to take that next step. It's because we care. You can do this. Now, here's Alan Antonio. Alan's also been a client for years. He's someone that heard me speak in a presentation just like the one that you're seeing now. And when he had the opportunity to get the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, he went to our website, ordered his copy, scheduled a call, he implemented the process, and here's what he's been able to achieve. So let's bring up Alan and see what he's been able to, to accomplish in his program. All right. Here's Alan and Janet. So key highlights from their process. After three years of building their policies, they already acquired enough cash value that they could withdraw enough money from the policies to pay off the bank mortgage on our rental real estate properties 13 years ahead of schedule. I say that again, 13 years ahead of schedule. That was a huge accomplishment knowing that we were now really using the infinite banking concept as it was intended. When our oldest daughter and son-in-law decided to purchase their first home, they were able to access a loan from her policy that we started and also funds from our policy to buy their home as a cash deal and not have to mortgage from a traditional bank. Currently, they're making payments back to us for the loan instead of the bank, thus keeping the idea of keeping the money in the family. This is the sharpest example of infinite banking in action. 
Alan and his family now have the money coming back to the family versus flowing away. His da oldest daughter and son-in-law, their objective was to purchase a home. Now they could have shopped outside the home. They could have gone to a conventional bank to mortgage the property. But Alan and Janet said, listen, we have capital, ready access capital, opportunity tracks you down. We have money available in the family banking system. So why don't you shop at home? We'll structure the repayment no different than had you have paid the money to someone else. And all the money that comes back in, you get to reaccess again. Isn't that good? That's another amazing example of infinite banking in action. All right, let's keep going. Let's compare, let's do a comparison. Let's compare how basically 99% of the Canadian car buying public purchases vehicles. Now, as I go through this, I want you to not only think of cars, I want you to think of anything that you would otherwise spend money on, lease, finance, paying cash, doesn't matter. Just think about anything. It's not just about cars. Now think about this. Each of these methods of the way most people buy cars requires an ongoing payment and it's a constant transfer of capital away from you. We've got the no purchase payment plan, which is leasing, right? You're making payments, but you never own anything. You've got the post purchase payment plan, which is financing, right? You don't own anything until you make your final payment. You've got the pre-purchase payment plan, which is saving cash in someone else's bank. Bad idea spending the cash, you got the car, but everyone else got all your money. And you permanently give up the opportunity to earn interest on that money for the rest of your lifetime and for every generation that comes after you. Now remember, what was Nelson Nash's first golden rule? Think long range, think three generations past your own. So if you give up the opportunity to earn interest, so does everyone else who comes after you. With each method above, who's getting all the money? Someone else's bank. Now, a couple of questions for you. How many vehicles have you and your family purchased up to this point in your lifetime? Now, whether you pay cash, whether you lease them, whether you finance them, how many vehicles have you and your family purchased up to this point in your lifetime? Go ahead and type it into the chat window. Okay, 14, seven, uh, eight, 65, Jason Colbert, my God, you must have really high insurance, uh, 12 plus, Okay, so I'll, I'm going to round this off here. So we're up to about well over 100 vehicles. Now let's presume for a moment that the average purchase price of a vehicle, just for this, uh, this exercise, that the average purchase price of a vehicle is 25,000 bucks. So 100 vehicles, 25,000 bucks. That's 2.5 million. 2.5 million that's been permanently transferred away from a fraction of the people that are on this webinar and we have 76 people here ask yourself this question from all the vehicles that you've paid cash for leased or financed up to this point in your life how much of the money do you have zero you you were only two of the four characters in the financial play you were the depositor and the borrower but you weren't the banker and you weren't the bank owner how many more vehicles are you and your family going to plan to buy for the rest of your lifetime People are likely to spend more money financing cars than they will ever save for retirement. That's scary. Now, this is my own example. In September of 2017, I decided to buy a new vehicle. Now, my decision was to buy a Ford Explorer. Please, no booze if you have anything against Ford. The reason I chose Ford is because during the uh, financial crisis, Ford was the only car company that did not accept any TARP bailout money. Now, it shouldn't surprise you that the Ford Motor Company has more than $3 billion of cash value in dividend paying participating whole life contracts. That's corporate owned life insurance. That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone on this webinar knowing what you know now. Now, the price tag of the vehicle was 55,000 bucks. I had a choice. I could have paid cash. So rather than put premium into my system of policies and my family, I could have saved money in someone else's bank and paid cash for the car. I would have got the car. Someone else would have gotten all my money. I could have financed it. So I could have used someone else's money, but I have to go through a gatekeeper and a toll taker to gain access to that. I have to qualify for it. And then I'm making payments on someone else's schedule. And if I don't make all the payments, not only do I not have the car, 
but I have none of the money that I paid up to that point. So I could have chosen to finance the vehicle. I could have leased it. I decided to access a policy loan to purchase the vehicle. Now here's how difficult that was. I requested $55,000 from the life insurance company. They responded with confirmation. Do you want us to electronically deposit the money in your account or mail you a check? I chose to receive the money via electronic deposit. Less than five banking business days later, the money was in my account. Now, how much money left my policy? None. All 100% of the cash value in my policy was uninterrupted by the loan. What the insurance company did is they placed a lien on the death benefit for the loan balance. 100% of my cash value, my pool of financial value is growing every day that I drive this depreciating asset. I set the repayment schedule of my loan. Now, what is the lost opportunity cost of choosing one option over the other? Now, let's presume for a moment that I had decided to pay cash for the vehicle. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen a lost opportunity cost calculator, but I'm gonna pull that up right now. We're gonna do a really quick exercise so that I can demonstrate a very key teaching moment here. So we'll go to lost opportunity calculator. I'll bring this up on my screen here in just a moment. There we go. Now, let's presume again that if I'm working with the same amount of money, 55,000 bucks, I'd like you to tell me what interest rate do you think I could earn on that money? 5%? Okay, Jason, that, that's high, but thank you. What if I just said 3%? Let's just be conservative. There we go. Okay, thanks, Alan. Yeah, let's say 3%. And my, uh, I'm turning 46 here over the weekend. And let's presume that my remaining life expectancy is another uh, 34 years. Let's just presume that that's my remaining life expectancy. Okay, that's the real cost of paying cash. So I permanently give up, just in my lifetime, the opportunity to earn $97,331 of interest. What I've done is I've transferred that energy to someone else's system. But because I accessed a policy loan to purchase the vehicle and my money in my policy never stops growing, there was nothing withdrawn from the policy. All of my capital st still is still growing in there. Who's earning that interest now? And it's a little higher than that, but who's earning this amount of interest now? Same amount of money, just a different process of achieving the objective. I say that again, it's the same amount of money I'm just using a different process to achieve the very same objective. So when you find yourself getting stuck in that rut of thinking, how much interest am I going to pay? I want you to stop yourself and ask yourself the question, how much interest am I giving up the opportunity to earn? And one is far more costly than the other. Now here's the process. I capitalized my policy. So I followed Nelson Nash's golden rule of don't be afraid to capitalize. My money must reside somewhere. I had to pay premium. I requested a policy loan for 55,000 bucks using my cash value as collateral. That's Nelson Nash's fourth golden rule. Don't do business with banks. The insurance company placed a lien on the death benefit for the loan balance. while 100% of my cash value continues growing daily and uninterrupted. I control the repayment schedule. So I decided to repay my policy loan at a rate of 1,066 bucks a month for five years. I'm still making repayments back to my own system. That's Nelson Nash's third golden rule. Don't steal the peas. Heaven forbid if something happens to me at any point along the way, my family receives the death benefit minus the remaining loan balance and they still own the car. That's Nelson Nash's first golden rule. Think long range. Where did the money come from to buy the car? Who owns it and who's got all the money? The money came from the insurance company. I own the car and I've got all the money. What happens if I choose to stop or modify my loan repayment schedule? Now, what happened to people during COVID when they had to modify their mortgage payment, their car payment? They went on a deferral and that deferral is going to be very costly. Now, if I had chosen to stop making policy loan repayments, 
nobody's calling me from the insurance company. Nobody. The reason the insurance company does not dictate a repayment schedule is because it's a contract and I'm the one who possesses contractual authority. The insurance company is only the administrator of the contract, not the owner. The insurance company doesn't ask me for a repayment schedule because the insurance company itself is guaranteeing the collateral for the loan, my cash value. And so there's no risk of default and no risk of any financial harm to anyone else who co-owns the insurance company. I'm either going to repay the policy loan in part or in full while I'm alive, or the loan balance is going to be deducted from the death benefit when I die. So if I die early, I'm a hero to my family. If I live long, I'm still a hero to my family. Think about that. How much of the money did I put toward policy loan payments can I use again? Every dollar that I put back into my system is instantly reaccessible to me. I get the car, I have all the money, and I recaptured the interest. If you can do this for cars, is there anything that you can't do it for? That's the fifth golden rule, to rethink your thinking. If you can do this for cars, is there anything that you can't do this for? Now, let's look at a personal retirement solution. This is good because people are thinking about that word retirement, which I personally don't like. I prefer the words passive income, but let's look at a personal retirement solution. Nasia is 45 years young, female, she doesn't smoke, she has a family. Her goal was to have 39,000 in net annual retirement income from age 65 to age 90. She deposits $30,000 a year into her dividend paying participating whole life policy, which is just a little bit more than the maximum RSP contribution she could make for 10 years. She pays the premium for 10 years and decides, you know what? I'm not going to put money into the policy after 10 years. That's her privilege. She puts 300,000 in. From age 65 till age 90, she accesses 39,827 bucks a year, tax free. Total out 1,035,000. She passes away at age 91 and she leaves 586,000 to her beneficiaries, income tax free. Now ask yourself this question. Is it easier to save 300,000 inside of the policy or would it have been easier for Nasia to accumulate 1,035,000 inside of a mutual fund or an RSP. Was there anything stupid about Nasia achieving her objective by following this process versus trying to accumulate inside of an RSP or a mutual fund? What's Nelson Nash's fifth golden rule? Rethink your thinking. Now for investors and business owners, I'm gonna show you this Amazon example because this is so, so good. I didn't get a chance to cover it in the previous webinar. So let's have some fun with this. Now, what I said was that when you have ready access capital, opportunity will track you down. Now in my family banking system, we have 49 policies, 49 policies. And I had uh, been presented with an opportunity. There was an Amazon reseller, very established, three years into their uh, process, profitable Amazon store doing exceptionally well. Now they had an opportunity to purchase uh, a large block of inventory at uh, an amazing price and they knew that the product would sell, it would, it would go on Amazon. So that store reseller approached me and said, Jason, I'd love to take advantage of this product buy, but I'm $20,000 short. Would you like to participate in this opportunity? So I said, well, what, what are you proposing? He said, well, I'll, uh, sell the inventory should take me a little less than a quarter to, to sell it. And you and I will split the net profit 50, 50. I said, that sounds like a great deal. Now, if I needed to go to someone else's bank to take advantage of that opportunity, then I would have to go through a few headaches to gain access to capital. All I did was contact the insurance company. I requested a policy loan for 20,000 bucks. So the insurance company's money showed up in my bank account, not my money. My money was still growing inside the policy uninterrupted. So I took the 20,000, gave it to Curtis and I said, good luck, hope things work out well. And here's what happened after that first quarter. I wanna show you this, I'm gonna pull this up on my screen. Okay, here's what happened. He put the $20,000 to work exactly the way that he told me he, he would. And after that quarter, the gross profit 
in US dollars was 5,600 bucks. Now our agreement was to split that profit 50-50. So my share of that divisible profit, of course, was 2,800 bucks. Now here's what I want to describe to you that is so important to understand. I took out a $20,000 policy loan and the insurance company that I accessed it from uh, basically applies a simple interest uh, amount of 6.7%. So simple interest accrues daily and it compounds once a year. So it's very inexpensive capital. So my carrying cost on this policy loan for 90 days was a whopping $330.41. Now, what was my share of the divisible profit? What was my carrying cost on the policy loan? That's a pregnant pause, so you can process what happened there. So when I take the 2800 I subtract my carrying cost of $330. My gross profit before taxes is $2,469. What do you think I did at the end of the quarter? If you're thinking what I think you're thinking, you're right. I asked Curtis, do you still need the 20000 in capital? I'm willing to redeploy it if you can find any use for it. He said, are you kidding? I'd love that. So he did that again. After the second quarter, our profits were a tad higher. My share of the visible profit was just over 3,000. How often would I continue doing that? So at the end of the second quarter, I said, you know what? Do you need, do you have the need for more capital? He said, I sure do. So I doubled. I said, well, I'm gonna give you 40,000 now. Same arrangement? He said, absolutely. So I'm using the life insurance company's money to take advantage of an opportunity that tracked me down. God forbid, if anything had happened to me during that, uh, those two quarters, I would leave no indebtedness behind to my family. My family would still receive the, the profit share. The loan balance would be wiped out by the death benefit and an abundant tax-free windfall would show up when it's needed the most. Now, don't forget, my total cash value continued rising uninterrupted the entire time. And this particular policy, which I started in 2012, this particular policy is growing cash value at a rate of 65 bucks a day. The simple interest on the policy loan was $3.67 a day. Think about that. At the end of the quarter, I had 25,580 because my cash value grew by 5,850 bucks. So remember what I said at the beginning of the webinar, Anything that you're already doing financially is radically improved when you introduce the process of becoming your own banker. So if you took advantage of the same opportunity that I did, but you did it the conventional way, I'm still going to come out farther ahead, even though we got the same amount of net income. Isn't that good? Give me a heck yeah in the chat window if you think that's good. Was that a good example? Now Sarblo needs some help from the group. Post your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat window. Post your questions in the Q&A. We're going to have Q&A at the end. All right. That was pretty fun, huh? Now, here's a corporate retirement solution. So for all you business owners out there, pay close attention. This is absolutely awesome. So Dylan, 45-year-old business owner, he doesn't smoke. Pretty healthy guy, as you can see. His objective was to have 41,000 of net annual retirement income from age 65 to age 90. The corporation, not Dylan, the company deposits 50,000 bucks a year into a corporate owned dividend paying policy for 10 years. Total in half a million bucks. The corporate tax on the daily cash value growth in the policy is nothing. The passive investment income tax, nothing. The corporate owned policy is not captured by the passive investment income rules. Now we talk to corporate owners all the time and we ask them, are you running a healthy profit? Are you in profit? Yep, we're in profit. Well, what are you doing with your surplus capital? Oh, well, you know, we're, our advisor said we should put some money into some investment where we bought shares in XYZ. I said, well, let me get this straight. You're in profit. Yep. You're running an established business. Yep. And you've been advised to take money that must reside somewhere, your money, and invest it in someone else's business. Am I hearing, am I hearing that right? 
Yeah, we're going to change that. <laughs> we're going to keep the money flowing back, not flowing away. So Dylan, from age 65 till age 90, accesses $41,005 per year after tax. The total out is $1,066,000, passes away at age 91. The net death benefit is 806,000, which is far more than he put in. Now, Dylan's passing gave rise to what's called a capital dividend account. It's a notional account in the corporation and the corporation is able to pay out 3.5 million in assets from the corporation to the surviving shareholders tax-free in the form of tax-free capital dividends. Isn't that good? Capital dividends are paid out tax-free. Understanding that your wealth must reside somewhere, did this policy take away any of Dylan's options? The corporation needs equipment, needs human resources, technology. The corporation has now become its own source of financing. Money's flowing back, not flowing away. Thinking about your kids, your grandkids, and your great-grandchildren. We've been taught to be divisive in the family. Think about this. How many of you can relate? You're growing up and you heard your parents say, someday you're going to move out and you're going to start your own family. You're going to have your own bills. You're going to have your own mortgage. Then you're really going to understand. How many of you can relate to that? The wealthy don't talk that way. The wealthy circle the wagons. They keep the money in the family. This is a picture of my family at our annual family banking meeting. Now I wanna share this with you because again, we have 49 policies in our family banking system. Everyone in this picture is life insured. Once a year, we have an annual family banking meeting. Now here's what's interesting. The children pick up on this much quicker than the adults do because it, children have much higher neuroplasticity. That's why it's much uh, better for a child to learn a new language at such a young age. This fellow here, my son, he was recognized at this meeting that we had for repaying his second policy loan. He was 11 at the time. He doesn't use language like, my dad told me someday I'm gonna move out and have my own bills. My dad told me that someday I'll understand. The language that he's using is, dad, we gotta keep the money in the family. I've made all my policy loan repayments. How soon can I access another policy loan? He's now 12 and he gets it. So when we get together as, as a family, we talk about how we're using the family banking system, how we're keeping money flowing back to the family, how it's creating a peaceful, stress-free financial way of life for our family. Now, I wanna share something with all of you that's very personal to me and very recent. This gentleman that you see here is Papa. And Papa retired um, about 14 years ago from the Edmonton Police Service after a, a very lengthy career, almost 34 years in the service. And he retired. And as we were building our, our system of policies in our family, I sat down with Papa and I said, Papa, I'd love to take out a policy on your life. You don't have to pay the premium. I'll pay the premium. I'm the policy owner. All that I would ask is that you consent to me insuring your life. And he said, well, Jason, I'm type two diabetic. I don't think that I'm going to be life insurable. I said, well, there's only one way to find out. Let's apply for it. So we did, and he got approved. And I purchased two policies on his life. And now what I told him was I said, Papa, God forbid, if anything happens to you, then Nona, which is his beautiful wife right next to him here, I said, Nona is not going to have another bad financial day in her lifetime. We're going to uh, take care of her. She'll be fine. And all that I would ask is to be reimbursed for the premium that I paid. And then the remaining death benefit balance, we're going to leave behind in a policy for all of your grandkids. So we're going to take a policy out on each one of your grandkids as a legacy from Papa. And he said, that sounds good to me. If I had introduced you to Papa Habs seven weeks ago, you would have seen this perfectly looking healthy man. He was diagnosed with cancer. It was inoperable, so it was terminal. He was admitted to hospice and he passed away on September the 12th. So his battle with cancer was difficult, but it was very short-lived. And we are now 
honoring that legacy. And I want to share with all of you, the reason I'm, I'm sharing this per very personal story with you is because the money is coming back to the family. It's a windfall. It's a windfall. Whereas how many of you have seen GoFundMe posts on Facebook? So-and-so just passed away. They've set up a GoFundMe page. Let's help out the family. This is the best GoFundMe that we could have ever created. And Nona, our entire family, were mourning the loss of Papa. But I'm sharing this with you to honor the legacy that he agreed to create. Everyone in this picture is going to pass away someday. And when that day comes, and it will come, there will be a windfall that comes back to the family. Tax-free. That's Nelson Nash's first golden rule. Think long range. Think three generations past your own. If we can do this, you can do this too. Now, over the course of your lifetime, I want you to think of all the money that leaves your family for things like mortgages, investments, cars, property, weddings, taxes, tuition, business loans, insurance, personal expenses, business expenses, recreational vehicles, vacations, sports, hobbies. Add up all the money that you've earned and spent up to this point in your life. Could you write me a check for that amount of money right now? Have the banking process work for you rather than against you. Let's recap. The truth, the difference between you getting stressed or staying relaxed financially is who controls the banking function in your life. You don't have to put your money in prison for decades and rely on someone else to achieve the financial abundance you deserve today. You don't have to be rich to become your own banker. I'll share with you, um, we, we uh, again, we're very grateful for uh, the, the introductions that we receive. Um, now, Tim uh, Dawson, he's a senior partner, chartered accountant with Myers Norris Penny. He's a strategic partner of Ascendant. He uh, does a lot of great work for our clients. He handles all of our family in corporate accounting. Uh, wonderful man. And he recognized that he didn't have knowledge of this process because he looked at the world with a bias. And once he understood what we did, he wouldn't hesitate to put us in front of anyone as evidenced by what he shares here. We're very grateful for the kind words that uh, he shared in this testimony and uh, asked us to share it with all of you. This process, you might be thinking, hey, this looks awesome, but how will I know if this will work for me? <laughs> well, that's a really legitimate question. Schedule your discovery call. Remember, click the link that you received or text the word schedule to the number that you see here and reserve a day and time that works best for you. If you book your call before the end of the webinar, if you book the call before the end of the webinar, here's what you're going to get. You're gonna get a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an authorized infinite banking practitioner on our team. You're going to receive complimentary access to an online video series. Now through the Nelson Nash Institute, they are charging $49.95 for people to access this video series. You're going to receive access to that from us at no cost. You get a clarity meeting. Now you might be thinking, hey, this all sounds great, but I don't wanna do this alone. Good, you need a coach and you receive lifetime coaching from our group. And we believe, and Nelson would attest, we are the very best at this, bar none in Canada. Every advisor on our team is an authorized infinite banking practitioner and they practice this process in their own lives. So important. There are more valuable resources for you to access. And uh, I'll show you a few of them right now. We love to give value in our webinars. Now, let me just resume uh, my share here. I'll just uh, close that window. There we go. All right. So if you visit the ascendantfinancial.ca website and you just visit the bookstore, you're going to see a lot of great reading material on the process. Now, you know the book Becoming Your Own Banker. If you find yourself thinking, hey, I want to get my hands on this book, then go ahead and click the link that you received. We sell it for less. We'll ship it anywhere in Canada. Let's get this book in your hands. Purchase a copy for someone that you think would also uh, benefit from the gift of what we do. Now, on the website, there's a lot of great resources for you. I'd love you to see our team. So just click through to meet our team. These are the amazing people that, that make all the greatness happen in our company. 
everyone from client services to client solutions to operations to our strategic partners uh, to Devin Moses who keep all of our technology assets working and um, and functioning great and then Rich and I get to look up at all the people that really make it all happen and so visit our website when you have an opportunity if you like the YouTubes just head on over to YouTube, visit our Ascendant Financial YouTube channel that we launched just a few weeks ago. Now on the last webinar, we only had 36 subscribers. We're up to a whopping 50. Isn't that good? We're growing quick. Our goal is to have 100,000 subscribers in the next five years. If you like podcasts, you can also find it on the YouTubes. Just ease on over to Wealth Without Bay Street and uh, you'll see every episode of our podcast. We even have our client series on there. Our clients, we love our clients. We're interviewing them on podcasts to share their stories with you. Isn't that good? All right, now let's do this. Let's have some fun here. I always like to say what Nelson shared with me years ago. If you understand the problem, the solution will become clear. You'll know exactly what to do. And you all received this link to the Nelson Nash film, the documentary that I had commissioned on Nelson back in September of 2017. And Nelson, uh, sadly, we lost Nelson in March of uh, last year. And uh, I was blessed beyond the definition of good fortune to be mentored by Nelson for so many years. I give all the credit, I give all the glory of this process to Nelson. Um, I would not be here with you today speaking about this had it not been for the impact that Nelson had on my life and by proxy today on your life. And so please uh, attend that website, watch the documentary. It's a wonderful 60 minutes, give you a glimpse into the essence of who Nelson was. Now you don't have to get a policy or a system of policies from us. There's lots of great people that you can work with, but please don't try and do this alone. Households and business owners, who do this right all have a good coach and we are great coaches. I recommend getting yourself a coach. And when you choose who you're going to work with, here are some things to think about. The first one is you gotta be careful about the life carrier that you put your policies with and ensure that your policies are designed properly. Secondly, most people who are selling you life insurance don't have expertise in this process. A life insurance contract is a product Becoming your own banker is a process. There's a distinction there. So make sure you work with somebody who specializes in becoming your own banker and who is thoroughly familiar with the process. You should choose someone who is an authorized infinite banking practitioner with the Nelson Nash Institute. Here's what that means. It means that they've completed a course of study. They've completed a mentoring program with an experienced practitioner. They practice this process in their own lives. The reason you should do this in your life now is that you deserve the outcome now. The longer you wait, the more you penalize yourself. The real questions are, what's the cost of doing nothing? What's the cost of just one more year of all of your money leaving your family or your business permanently? What's the cost of giving up all the interest that your money could have otherwise earned? Schedule a time to meet with us. It's included with the webinar. All of these testimonials all of these Google reviews, they're all from clients, people who have implemented this process in their lives. And every review, every five-star rating on Google, we're extremely grateful for. If you're on the webinar and you've left one of those for us, thank you, sincerely, we're grateful. Now, if you're committed to this, schedule a Becoming Your Own Banker call. Are you committed? Type it into the chat window. We have 67 people left on the webinar. Are you committed? Awesome. Keep the yeses coming. Awesome. And we know if all this process did was keep more money in your family or business, would it be worth it? If all it did was create a peaceful, stress-free financial life, would it be worth it? You've got two choices. You can do nothing and nothing will change. You'll continue to work your butt off for the banks and everyone else gets all your money. Schedule your call and put financial control back in your hands. That's your second choice. I want you to picture a day when financial control is in your hands, not the bank, not the government, and not some risky stock market. 
Picture a day when your spouse says, thank you. Thank you for not making me wait 30 years to enjoy the life that we want today. Picture a day when your finances are exactly where you want them to be. And you know with certainty that you have the freedom to travel when you want to travel, relax when you want to relax, and serve who you want to serve. I'll leave you with this. I was 24. All my belongings were packed in my Chevy Beretta. And I was ready for the three day drive from Timmins, Ontario to a new life in Edmonton, Alberta. And standing in the foyer of my dad's home, he wrapped me in a big bear hug and he said, son, I'm proud of you. Drive careful, call me when you get to Edmonton and don't get any speeding tickets along the way. I got pulled over by the RCMP just outside of Winnipeg and I got my very first speeding ticket. And when I arrived in Edmonton, I didn't call home. I got straight to work. And three weeks later, I was sitting down to dinner with my team and I remembered to call my dad. I excused myself from the table and I made the call. My stepmom answered the phone and when I asked to speak to dad, she said, well, he's in the bathroom. Do you wanna wait? And I said, no, I don't have a half an hour. Please let him know I apologize for not calling sooner, that things are going great and we'll catch up as soon as I can. The very next morning, I was paged to an urgent phone call. And when I picked up the phone, it was my stepmom, Beverly, and she was frantic. She told me that my dad passed away suddenly and unexpectedly. I was devastated. I know it's human nature to procrastinate and think that there's always going to be time. But what I learned is you can't wait. When my dad died unexpectedly, I felt lost. I was full of regret and I felt like I let him down. Since then, I've dedicated my life to helping people just like you to live a fulfilling life now so there are no regrets later. You deserve a life of no regrets. You deserve to be in control of your financial future. You deserve a lifetime of abundance. So join me and let's get you the life that you deserve. Thank you all so much for staying on the webinar, for being with us this evening. We're going to open it up now to Q&A. We hope you stick around because Q&A is a lot of fun. And so Sarblo, let's do that. Let's open it up to Q&A. Now, Sarblo, if you want to come in, I'm going to ask you to unmute. If you want to hop on and just help me with, help me with the Q&A, let's bounce into the Q&A window and let's, have, let's, let's get at it. Sounds good, Jason. The first question is from Brian. And the question is, what is the minimum lump sum value of a dividend paying whole life policy available for purchase? Um, first of all, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking. The, uh, the, the important thing to understand is that we're not solving for death benefit. We're solving for accumulating cash value as rapidly as possible. And so the question then becomes, what is the minimum amount of premium that I can choose to deposit in a policy? Now we have clients that have deposit as little as hundred dollars a month. We have clients that deposit very high six figures every month. And so Brian, if you're somewhere in between those two numbers, we can help you. Awesome. Our next question is from E Nielsen and it's a similar question. How does the insurance uh, or how much does the insurance cost? So I think you already answered that question, Jason. Brian has another question just as on your car finance example. The question is, the $55,000 car loan based on what policy value? Um, well, there, there are several policy values. So the death benefit in that policy at that time was just over 920,000. And the total cash value that had accumulated in the policy up to that point uh, was just under 120,000 if my memory serves me correctly. So awesome. my, my policy design has no value on anybody that's, it has no bearing to anybody who's on the webinar. This is all about you creating your financial objective. Don't worry about my car purchase. What I illustrated was the process. So think about this as it relates to you, not as it relates to me. My policy values don't have any bearing on you. The other question is from Mike Nowak. I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name properly, the last name. Yep. The question is, in, uh, so this is on your Amazon venture. And the question is, in your Amazon venture, yep. you still need to pay tax on the income, correct? Yep. 
And then Adam has a similar question. What is a policy cost per month? I think we've already answered that. Uh, the next question from Adam is when we pay the premium, who does that go to? It goes into the, uh, basically the general fund, the participating account of the insurance company that you co-own. Uh, the other question is from Nefi and the question is, uh, could you have a look at my finances and see how I can start this process? How expensive is the start? Great question. So scheduling your uh, becoming your own banker call uh, requires no out-of-pocket expense on your part. And if you establish a basis to work with an authorized practitioner on our team, when uh, the solution is ready to be implemented and the policy or the system of policies is put into place, there's no out-of-pocket expense on your part to the advisor. The life insurance company compensates the advisor a commission for the placement of the policy, and we're paid extremely well to do what we do. Uh, the next question is again from Adam. It's, it's more a comment than a question. Uh, and here's the comment. It says, so this is like a 10-year plan to put that cash value into power plan to grow so you can be your own bank. Um, I, I would say that that's, um, yeah, I, I mean, that's a fair comment. Uh, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, when we talk about putting premium into a policy, the question that, you, that you'll be asking yourself at that 10th year is how long can I continue paying the premium for? Because when you see how these policies are accelerating and growing and you understand that your money must reside somewhere and you're going to need the use of money for the rest of your lifetime, then what better place to have it reside than there? The next question is from Alan. I would like to understand that corporate business one more with Dylan. So, sure. Yeah, I would uh, just maybe ask uh, to have that question expanded on. So, what specifically would you like to understand uh, more? And we'd be happy to do that. Uh, next question is from Barb. I want to purchase a second house with my policy. Can you give me an example of how I could do this? Meet with an authorized practitioner, and maybe more than happy to do that for you. Next is from Eric. How long before you can access the cash in your policy? Uh, it's immediate. So the way that we design the policy, loan amounts are accessible right away. And the next is from Barb. What if we already have a whole life policy? First of all, congratulations for having a, a whole life policy. Um, I think that it wouldn't hurt to have someone take a look at it to see if it can be enhanced in any way. Uh, if not to affirm that you've got a great policy and that's excellent. Um, or to identify an opportunity for you to expand your program. The other is from Adam. Uh, the question is, where do I sign up for a call? Uh, so Adam, you would have received a link that was either emailed to you or text messaged to you. If you have not received that, then just go ahead, let Sarplo know, type it in and let them know, and we'll make sure that a link gets forwarded to you for uh, to schedule that. You can also, like we uh, had indicated in the... Um, in the slides here that you can go ahead and click the link or you can text the word schedule. Sarbo, let me just bring this up on the screen here real quick. We'll just bring this up because the number, let's just get that number in front of everybody again here, just for your knowledge. All right, let's share the screen, there we go. So this is how to do that. So if you haven't received the link in text or email, you can either request it or you can simply text the word schedule to 587-816-6399. I'll just leave that on the screen here for a moment. And the next question is from Sid Voitas. Uh, if you have a policy, can you add lump sum to it? Uh, yes, the answer to that question is yes. And next is from Gita. When we access policy loans, what interest we have to pay to insurance company? Uh, the interest is simple. So it accrues on the policy loan daily and it compounds once a year. And remember, you're a part owner of the insurance company and remember the grocery store example. Would you walk out the back door and not pay anything or would you go out the front door and pay retail? So when you access a policy loan, pay more than retail. Don't just pay the loan principal plus the simple interest that's occurring. I repay my policy loans at a simple interest rate of 
In that example with my car, the simple interest calculation when I first took out the policy loan was 7%. In the example for my Amazon opportunity, it was 6.7. It's now dropped to 6.2. I don't care about the rate. I care about the volume and most importantly, who's getting the money. So you gotta stop thinking about rates. You gotta think about the process of who's getting the money. This isn't a function of rates. Great question though, thank you for asking it. Yeah. Next question, so Mike Chasen, the question is, so are you borrowing on the cash values or the debt benefit? You're using the cash value as collateral, so you're borrowing against the cash value and the lien for the loan balance is placed on the debt benefit. Next is from Devin Borsboom. How are you better off taking a policy loan for living expenses quarterly instead of paying cash if you pay 6% interest rate on the policy loan? Can you show mathematically? That's a great question. Thank you, Devin. Um, I'd love to meet with you one-on-one uh, -on -one to, to demonstrate that, absolutely. Because remember, what I'd like you to add to your question, and I'd like you to work out mathematically, is how much interest are you giving up the opportunity to earn when you use your own cash? And so you and I will compare the numbers, and then I think you'll arrive at the, uh, the appropriate course of action all on your own. Awesome. Next is from Eric, and I think we already answered this. The question is, can you put a lump sum amount into your policy? Yeah. Uh, next is from Danielle. Do you offer your services in Quebec? Yes. So we are registered, Ascendant Financial is registered in Quebec, and we have a joint venture with an existing firm in Quebec. And the advisor that uh, we facilitate introductions to is an authorized practitioner with the Nelson Nash Institute. And uh, so, yes. We have another question from Adam. The question is, when you are charged an interest by the insurance company, does it go back into your policy? Um, that is something that I think we would want to have an expanded conversation on. But just to give you, um, sort of get the thought starter going. So when you repay a policy loan, you're repaying principal and you're repaying simple interest. Simple interest and the principal goes back into the participating account of the insurance company. The simple interest component is profit. And the dividend that is paid on the policy is primarily calculated based on your net contribution to the earnings of the insurance company. And so, I, again, I take you back to the grocery store example. When money comes into the grocery store, if we put a little bit more money into the cash register than the retail price of the peas, we have more money available to go and purchase more cans of peas. So if you put more money into the insurance company that you co-own, the insurance company has more money available to provide to more captive borrowers. It makes perfect sense. And so again, this is a function of who's getting the money, who's getting the money, who's getting the money and who that money is being put to work for, regardless of the rate, regardless of the word interest, who's getting the money and more importantly, who's that money being put to work for. The insurance company puts simple interest to work for the benefit of you and for everyone else who co-owns the business, just like the grocery store. Ask yourself this question. Would I have much of a grocery store business if I was the only person who shopped there? The answer is no. You have to build it so that your needs are met and so that other people can prosper as well. Next is from Alan Jason. The question is, would it be wise to cash out your RRSP over a few years to make the policy payments? Uh, well, I wouldn't give a blanket response to that. Uh, th that would be premature um, and not you know, a, a good thing to do. What I would say is that um, I would advise, uh, what was the gentleman's name again? Alan. I would advise Alan to schedule a time, make sure you're uh, speaking with an authorized practitioner. And then when you get to that stage to determine, hey, what's the best source of premium for my policy? If you're considering using your RSPs, then we highly recommend that we get engaged with your, your accountant or whomever uh, is providing you with designated tax advice, just so you understand the consequences from a tax perspective of doing that. But we do uh, have clients who go through that process they get good guidance from their accountant and they ultimately decide to use their RSPs as a source of premium. So yes, but we're, we wouldn't say that that's something everyone should do. 
And next is from Brian again. Do you consider this model as being superior to a typical retirement concept? Um, that would be an understatement, Brian. This process beats the pants off of any other concept that I've seen. Next is from Ragnation. I hope I'm pronouncing his name properly. Um, my apologies if I'm not. Which insurance companies are best for participating policies to create a good cash value? Well, we don't wanna run a commercial for any one particular life insurance company. Connect with an authorized practitioner, go through the process, and the practitioner will um, not only answer that question for you, but also let you know why they chose the insurance company that they did. And next is from Sanjay. The question is, I still have to pay in trust then how different is it from conventional loan? Great question. So when you borrow money, so Sarbala, I'll just lead you through this. Can you role play this with me? Absolutely. So if you borrowed money from a commercial bank, I don't care what the rate is. When you make a payment to principal and interest, who controls that repayment schedule? It's the commercial bank. And when the commercial bank receives the payment, who do they put the money to work for? It'll be the bank owners. Right. And so when you make a payment to principal and interest, as a policy loan repayment, who controls the repayment schedule? It'll be the policy owner. In this case, you. Yes. And who is the insurance company putting that money to work for? Me, I'm the policy owner. Or all the participating policy owners. I rest my case. Okay. Awesome. Next is from Leslie. Is it better to have one policy that you can pay for many years or open up additional policies after five years or so? Um, that's a wonderful question. I mean, our experience has been over the years that uh, clients end up with multiple policies uh, in order to achieve their specific objectives. Remember, this process doesn't happen overnight. This takes time. And so it would not be uh, well advised to take all of your capital and put it into one policy right from the get go. This is meant to happen gradually over a period of time. Next question, again from Alan. Can a corporation buy a whole life policy on its principles? What was the tax-free system built? Yeah, uh, so corporations can most definitely purchase uh, par dividend paying policies on their principles. And these policies are not captured by the passive investment income rules. Uh, the daily cash value growth attracts no taxation. Uh, the death benefit proceeds less the cost basis of the policy are paid into the corporation when one of the principals whose life is insured passes away and the corporation receives a credit to their capital dividend account and the, uh, the money is paid out of the corporation to surviving shareholders via tax-free capital dividends. And the corporation itself can practice the process of becoming your own banker when the corporation needs ready access capital for all the things that it needs to operate. Next is from Ben. Could my 75 year old parents benefit from this as well? Absolutely, because they're going to need the use of money for the rest of their lifetime. So yes. And next is from Mike. How do you insure others? That is, how do you have 40 odd policies? Well, you have to have a beneficial interest in the life that you're considering insuring. So it can be a parent, it can be a child, a grandchild, a great grandchild, your spouse, a business partner, a joint venture partner, and so on. So in our family, we have, uh, I've insured the lives of all of my nephews and nieces, um, my spouse, my in-laws, um, Sarblo, I own a policy on your life. Our corporation owns policies on you um, because you're a key person in our company. Corporation owns policies on me. Um, so we, yeah, we have, uh, we have insured the lives that we have a beneficial interest in, my assistant, uh, my sister, uh, and so on. Next is from Tharshi. My apologies, Tharshi, if I'm not pronouncing your name properly. The question is, can I move my existing life insurance over to Ascendant Financial? Uh, that's a possibility. I would encourage you to schedule a call. Connect with an authorized practitioner. Another question from same person. Do you have an office in Ontario? Yes, we do. So uh, we are licensed coast to coast and we have practitioners um, available to assist. The answer is yes. Next is from Ben again. I'm older and I participate in extreme sports. Will my premiums be higher because of that? Uh, potentially. There's only one way to find out. Next is from Eric. The interest paid by me into the policy, is that tax deduct deductible, say for an investment? 
uh, if the investment is um, one that produces taxable gain or taxable income. Yes. Next is from Sid. How long after the policy starts is the first dividend? Uh, the dividend is declared one time annually and it is paid on your policy anniversary date once a year. Next is from Barb. What happens to the money going into the policy if I never need a loan? Uh, the money continues accumulating. So the cash value grows on a daily basis and uh, not if, but when you pass away, the total death benefit is paid income tax free. Uh, the next person, Jason is anonymous. Don't, don't ask me the question. Okay. Hey, Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous, let us know who you are. I don't talk to anonymous people. Don't do that on our webinars. Next is from Letitia. Letitia, I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. I'm aware of the other benefits of life insurance on the back end. At the yeah. same time, whole life premiums are not inexpensive. Is it really worth it? Is it really worth setting it up um, with the primary objectives of borrowing against the cash values? Absolutely, because as the proposed policy owner, you're the one that decides how much premium you deposit into your system. And so whatever your definition of expensive is, just make sure the amount you choose is less than that. Next is from Eric, the insurance company, are they local or international? Uh, they are Canadian based Canadian operators. And follow up question from Eric, do you have to do a medical to get a policy? Uh, that, that is a possibility, yes. Next from Alan again, what happens if both my wife and I can't be insured? Then you should choose someone that you have a beneficial interest in. And I, I went through that list uh, earlier. And the next question again from Alan, what is the average dividend rate on these policies? Who cares? Carry on, let's, uh, so the last question for the day, Jason, and this is from Millennius. Does one receive any benefit from introducing people to this program? Yes, you're, you're going to be impacting their life in a way that's incalculable. Incalculable. We, we've had uh, clients that have been introduced to us, which every introduction we are eternally grateful for. And we've had to deliver death claims. And we haven't had a single family yet indicate to us that they wish the check that we showed up with was for less. And so by you introducing someone to this process, you are going to have an incalculable positive impact on their life, not only while they're here, but for those that they leave behind when they're gone. One of our late mentors used to say, I wish everyone could die once for a week and see the problems that they leave behind. And so if you believe that someone can benefit from the gift of this process, we would wholeheartedly encourage you to introduce them to it. And it doesn't have to be with us. Just introduce them to the process and uh, let them decide who to work with. One of the things that uh, most attendees have been asking are, Will there be a replay to this webinar? Yes. Yeah, a replay link will be sent out to everyone who enrolled and attended. And it'll also be sent out to everyone who enrolled but couldn't be here with us tonight. That's it for questions, Jason. All right. Well, hey, 818 Mountain Time. Can't thank everyone enough uh, again for committing uh, your time and being here with us. We know you could have been doing other things and we sincerely appreciate you spending it with us. So. Thank you so much, everyone. Please enjoy the rest of your day. We really, really appreciate you being with us. Um, please get your call scheduled. You'll be glad you did. It's included with the webinar. And we all look forward to connecting with you real soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.